I hope those overviews are helpful to you to learn more about stuff. What we're doing is we're, we're covering the 52 major stories in the Bible this year, which means we're skipping a lot of important stuff. So that's why I'm sometimes showing you those videos to help cover stuff that I am not covering today. I was told you had a decent guest preacher last week. All right. That was, that was difficult to preach to a... Uh, Empty room. It wasn't totally empty. Jordan was in here with Addie making noise, and he took her out because she was making a lot of noise. Let me raise this up. Some pastor's kids. I lowered that. Hey, no one came today, but if you would like to read George Mueller and discuss it, you know, we have our, was it coming up on our fourth summer where we do a ministry intern program? This book by far is always the favorite that I have our interns read. I think it would be incredibly helpful for you and uh, learning um, about God's power and his faithfulness to provide also gives you insight into how I think because I've been influenced by George Mueller more than any other person. Okay, we're talking about Samson. So find one of your bulletins. There should be bulletins on your table. If not, there's some on these other ones. This is a little tricky. Um, I, I have a great sermon on Ruth. I studied a lot and we had it all together and I realized, well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm ahead. I'm supposed to be preaching Samson. So then I had to go back and do a sermon on Samson, put that together. So a reminder, screen's kind of messed up there. It's a little cut off at the top. Reminder from that video, the cycle in Judges. First, God's people rebel and, quote, do what is right in their own eyes. Step two in the cycle, God hands his people over to their enemies. Step three, God's people cry out for deliverance. Step four, God sends a deliverer to deliver them as they're wanting. Repeat ad nauseum and repeat to your own dismay as you're reading the story. This is the cycle of judges because they have no king and do what is right in their own eyes. A and don't get think, oh, if, I, if they have a king, it would be all better. No, we find out in Samuel, the uh, book of 1 Samuel, the idea was that, no, God was supposed to be their king but they had no king. In other words, they're not following God as their king. Now, Samson embodies Israel, and Israel embodies all of humanity. What do I mean by that? Samson is in microcosm, you might say. He is embodying all of the things about Israel in one person. The good and the bad of Israel is supposed to be embodied here in in. As we read the story, it shows up in one man, Samson. This actually happens a lot through Scripture. Samson is a type and shadow of things to come. Jesus is the embodiment of Israel as well, as happens later. But then Israel is also the embodiment of all humanity. So when we read the stories of Israel in the Old Testament, they're the stories of humanity, right? There's nothing unique in the Old Testament that hasn't happened in every other time in every other part of the globe throughout human history. All of the violence and some of the goodness, but everything that you see in the Old Testament, it's not unique to the Jewish people. It happens throughout the globe. It happens today. We've got more technology and, and glitz it up, but it's the same basic sins happening in the family relationships and all the problems. It still is happening today. So when we read Samson, we're seeing a microcosm the, the people of Israel. And when we read about people of Israel, we're reading about us. We're reading about you and about me. And we're reading about 20, 21st century? No? Is that what we're in? 21st century United States, right? Because people are people are people, right? It's the same stuff happening today. The Old Testament, the temple, the law, the priests, Israel as a people group, and individuals, individual characters that are represented and, and elaborated upon in Scripture, contains types and shadows of things to come. This is an important idea that really helps you understand the Old Testament. Okay, You, you need to be reading your Old Testament. Did you know that Jesus never once quoted from the New Testament as he preached? Yeah, it's supposed to be a joke because there was no New Testament, right? Jesus quotes from the old, Sean got it, yeah, I heard her chuckle. Jesus, the only, ta only parts of scripture he ever quoted from are the Old Testament, right? So if it was important enough for Jesus to have it memorized and then be quoting it around, it's probably got some important stuff in it. Fun tidbit, his favorite books were Deuteronomy, 
Jeremiah and Isaiah. He quotes from them a lot. There's important stuff in there. But admittedly, it's difficult to know what we do with this stuff, right? The story of Samson reminds you of some sort of Shakespearean tragedy, kind of like Hamlet or probably more accurately, some of the Greek tragedies, you know, Achilles and people like that and uh, Odysseus. And they've got these heroic uh, attributes, but they've also got these flaws and their flaws become their um, their doom and their demise, right? And so you think, well, what do I do with the story of Samson? How on earth does this relate to me? I, I don't exactly have Samson's strength. I cut my hair. Um, uh-oh, I think our... Uh, screen got messed up there. I cut my hair. You know, how, how, what do we do about Samson? Let me get this back. There we go. Okay. And, and so you've got to understand as you're reading the Old Testament, the Old Testament is there are types and shadows of things to come. So Samson is a shadow of something to come. And so this language is in the New Testament. It's the idea of a shadow, something's coming around the corner if the sun is in the right spot. You can see someone coming around the corner before they come if their shadow is going out in front of them. That language, that idea is used in the New Testament. First Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. Now these things, he's talking about Israel's history here. And he's basically summarizing what we read about in the Old Testament. Now these things, that is Israel's history, occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. The, the subtitle in my Bible as I was pulling this up was uh, something like Israel's history. And he's just summarizing everything you're reading about in the Old Testament, Paul says. They were examples to keep us from setting our hearts. So as you read about the bad things in Israel's history, they're warnings for us. Don't follow their path, right? It's a, it's a type. It's a shadow. Another place is 1 Corinthians 10. These things happened to them, that is Israel in the Old Testament, as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. That's a nice way to describe the year of our Lord, right? And then Hebrews 10, the writer of Hebrews, talking about so much of these, so many of these Old Testament characters, and even mentions Samson and a few other judges in the book of Judges Samson, Barak, Jephthah, and Gideon. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. So the writer of Hebrews is specifically referencing the law. What on earth do we do about the law? The 613 laws admonitions to do things and, and not do other things that are found in Scripture. What do we do with these things? Well, the writer of Hebrews says, this is, the law is a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities for themselves. So when God says, abstain from these foods, don't, eat, don't wear clothing of mixed fabric, do this with your field and not do this with your field, treat the immigrant and the widow and the foreigner in these ways, and, and, and don't eat these foods, and don't cook in these ways, keep kosher. What's all this... Hebrews, the Hebrews writer is saying, look, the point wasn't the law, okay? The law is like a shadow. It's meant to show you something is coming right around the corner. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near, uh, near to worship. And so he's saying, the law is only supposed to give you a, a, an foreshadowing of something greater that's coming. The laws commanding you to sacrifice, it's not about the sacrifice. It's to say, hey, something better is coming. Okay, so that's how the New Testament explains the Old Testament. They're types and shadows and, and warnings uh, of for us today. Now, here's some things to notice in Samson's story. Notice number one, this is all in your bulletin, sin is a power. Ephesians 6.12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the, the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly, heavenly realm. Some of the older translations, for we do not wage war against, the, against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of this age. Hey, could you remember that when you're on Facebook before you, you want to post a rant about something? We do not wage war against flesh and blood, friends, but against the powers and principalities. So there's a time to post some, something, but sometimes more often we should just pray because we're not fighting people. We're fighting dark forces in this world, okay? So notice those things. Now, s number two, sin is broken relationship. Sin is not just power, as Paul talks about. Sin is 
broken relationship, both break, breaking relationship with people or God and others. Okay, we see this played out. Number three, sin is idolatry. Anytime we are sinning, that's worship. Sin is worship. Now, worship to the true God, that's worship. Worship to anything but God, that's sin. So sin is a form of worship because we're worshiping anything other than God. Number four, you'll notice in the story, sin is costly. Anyone ever sinned and you feel like, man, that was expensive, right? I mean, that cost me something. It cost Samson a lot. Sin is costly. Here's the story of Samson. Samson's covered in several chapters in the book of Judges, and so I'm just having to just pick bits of it if I'm going to cover his entire life. A certain nam man named Zorah, named Manoah, from the clan of the Danites, had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. This story, this theme happens a lot. A childless woman is desperate for a child, and a miracle happens enabling her to conceive. And, of course, we have the variation of it in the New Testament. A woman who should not have been able to conceive, conceives and gives birth to Jesus, right? The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. And there's a lot more to this story. I mean, it's a, it's a really good story. You ought to go read it. Um, she's a, we're not, we don't read uh, Samson's name or Samson's mother's name, but she's a smart woman. It's, there's some comical parts to it. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. This is the angel speaking to Samson's mother as she's learning that she's going to conceive. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of of the Philistines. Nazarites, their book, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, it may be touched in two different places. You can read about the Nazarites. It's a vow. They're not a separate people group, and no, they're not from Nazareth either. It sounds like the town of Nazareth, but there's not a connection, actually. And, and so Nazarites would be a, a vow. So the best equivalent might be um, monks and nuns today. They take a special vow to become an, a monk or a nun, and then it even affects their clothing, called a habit for a nun. And so you can uh, quite literally see a nun and know, oh, she's taking special vows. It's very evident down to where she lives and down to what she wears um, or doesn't wear that she has made a special vow. So in the Old Testament, you had these Nazarites. They're not a separate people group. It's just certain people who've decided to fast from certain things, taking a vow towards or to God, for certain reasons. They didn't drink alcohol. Technically, it's more than that. It's no fruit of the vine of any kind, so they couldn't even eat grapes. Um, not to touch any unclean or eat any unclean thing. That extended even to um, dead bodies in your family. So if your, uh, the tradition would have been if a family member dies, your immediate family, will you help take care of the body because there's no Duane back then. You can't call the funeral director. You take care of your loved one's um, deceased body. Uh, so that meant a Nazarite could not even participate and could not get near the family. They would have to be away. They can't even participate in the mourning practices of their own family. This is a big sacrifice. And they're not to cut their hair. And so for very visibly, they look different. They consecrated themselves to God in expectation for what would happen through God. So anyone could take a, a Nazarite vow, and it's laid out in Exodus or Leviticus, I forget now, of what you need to do. And so maybe you've got a big, big, big prayer request, and you want God to answer. And so you say, God, I'm going to take a Nazarite vow in, in expectation that you will answer this prayer. The only equivalent we would have is just fasting today. So we fast from things believing that God's going to answer the prayer. It's an act of worship. Well, the Nazarite vow is a big fast, okay? But they, they consecrated themselves to God in expectation for what would happen through God. So that's Samson. Now, Samson's life would show the expectation that this time in the cycle of Judges, things would be different. So we read the story, and you saw from the video, over and over and over, 
You have judge after judge who comes. God sends a judge, raises them up, saves the people temporarily, but they rebel again, and then they're handed back over to their enemies. Everything about the story, I mean, th- some of the judges, we hardly read anything about them, but chapter after chapter is dedicated to Samson, and a lot is dedicated to his birth and before he's even born, and you get the idea, oh man, something special is going to happen. You read the, the pre-birth story of Samson, it's like reading the story of Mary and Joseph before Jesus comes along. You get the idea. This boy, he's going to be special. It's like reading John the Baptist and Jesus. Man, God is going to do mighty things through this one. It's like reading the, the baby infant narrative about the, uh, Moses and the Nile. Oh my goodness. This baby Moses, something special is going to happen with this guy. And so, you're, as the reader, you're set up to think, oh man, what's going to happen? This is a great story. But everything about it goes haywire. Samson's birth creates expectation of a great Savior, but his life disappoints as we see his great failures. And bam, 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 like the first, like we read about him being born or pre-born, and, and then the next verses, he's like the age to be able to marry, and man, it goes downhill so fast. Instead of delivering Israel from the Philistines, remember that's the verse the angel says, he will lead Israel. Israel. He will lead them in fighting off their enemies. And the first verse we read about uh, Samson after he's born and now he's at the age of marrying, instead of delivering Israel from Philistines, he marries a Philistine. He marries one of their enemies. When he returned, that is Samson, he said to his father and mother, so just before this, he's gone to Philistine territory. He sees a woman that he thinks is attractive, and he goes to his dad, and he says, Dad, I want that one over there. And he and dad have an argument about it. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? That's the Jewish people. Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? It's, that's, that's supposed to be an insult. It's an odd thing to be thrown around as an insult today. But that's what it was, an uncircumcised Philistine. But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. There's really no great translation, but the current 2011 NIV translation here, it's, it's not really <laughs> the most helpful. The Hebrew that Samson uses when he says she's the right one for me means looking smooth, straight, or right. So the most literal translation, it, it, in a sense, is get her for me for she looks right or she looks good. And it's the idea of eyeballing an object's position instead of measuring it. Okay, has anyone ever done that where you've hung in a a picture frame and you say, oh yeah, that looks right. And then the person you married says, no, I don't think that's right. And you get a level and turns out, oh, sure enough, it's not right. Uh, We have this, uh, there's in the Parsonage, there's like a bookshelf and we had some work done. A carpenter came in to make a spot where the TV could go in there. And it wasn't actually built to square. And so he came in and he makes it square. And I said, this doesn't look square. And turns out what it was, technically it was square, but it wasn't square with everything else in there. And so we had to adjust because what was true in the measurements didn't look good on the eyes, right? But so often what looks good on the eyes is uh, is the reverse too. It's not actually level or it's not straight. So the word he's using here is it looks straight. It looks level. She looks good. I mean, you just get the idea. He's just like a shallow frat boy here. Dad, I want her because she looks pretty. Right? That's the idea here. There's, there's nothing about this is a godly woman. We'll talk about Ruth next week. You know, this is a woman of integrity. Uh, she's got a servant's heart. She's humble. She's really respectful of her family and her neighborhood. No, she looks pretty. To, she looks good to me, so I want her. That's the picture here of what's happening. Okay? No idea that she's measuring uh, his potential wife against the standards God would have or the plumb line of God. He says, no. What my eye sees, my eyes like. And I want her. It's that simple. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. So the same word that, that Samson uses, 
daddy, get her for me because she looks good. She looks straight. She looks smooth is one of the options. You can kind of get the idea. What's he looking at here? It's the same word as everyone. This is the last verse in the whole book of Judges. Oh, man, you read the end of bu- Judges and, oh, it's just, it's awful. It's a, it's a terrible ending. And this is the summary. It, the, the writer is saying, hey, every bad and nasty and violent thing you just read in this book, it's because of this, per, bu- this verse, this idea. They had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit, as they saw right. Every bad thing in the book of Judges is because people, not in a physical sense, but in a mental and the idea of making decisions, they're eyeballing every decision in their life. They're saying, hmm, that looks like a good idea. I think I'll do it. And it ends terribly. And that's what's happening here in Samson's life as well. Instead of avoiding unclean things, he seeks them out. There's this story. He comes upon a lion and he kills it with his bare hands. He's a Nazarite. He's not supposed to touch any dead thing. So if he comes across a wild animal that might kill him, to be faithful to his vow, he should have killed it with some sort of spear, sword, something where he's not physically with his own body touching it. And so he could have protected himself without touching the animal. He chooses not to do that. He uses his strength in ways that betrays his covenant, his Nazarite covenant, and he kills the animal with his dead and with his bare hands, and then he comes back later to find this dead carcass on the road. Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, that is the woman he, he decided he liked, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, and in it he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. This is a weird story. Sherry and Lyle could maybe give us insight to it. Apparently, the rib cage of the lion seemed like a good place to set up shop for a bee's nest and he sees the carcass there and so he goes to it and gets honey he scooped out the honey with his hands and ate it as he went along when he rejoined his parents he gave them some and they too ate it but he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass why didn't he tell them because he knew they would have been appalled that they broke their Nazarite vow. It doesn't matter whether or not you've taken a Nazarite vow. You don't need to be eating your snacks from roadkill, right? This is nasty, okay? But he's, it's just this blatant disregard for his vow. And his parents, we read from the story, his parents are good Jewish parents. Whether they've taken a Nazarite vow or not, no Jew is supposed to be eating from a dead animal like this, this makes them ceremonially unclean. He doesn't care. He's so just wantonly disrespectful. Instead of avoiding alcohol, he apparently drinks heavy and often. And this one is not explicit in the story. You've got to know a little bit of culture and read between the lines. But it does seem pretty clear that this is what's happening. Now his father went down to see the woman, that is to set up the arrangement for the wedding, and there Samson held a feast, as was customary for young men. This was a betrothal feast. Before he actually gets married, they have a feast to celebrate. Hey, this family and I, these two families we've arranged, and our children are going to get married, and they have a feast together. When the people saw him, they chose 30 men to be his companions. We would say something like uh, groomsmen today. Uh, Now, what you need to know about back then is, for one, everyone drank. Don't listen to (laughs) any um, Christian conservative today that says the the wine in the the Bible was not alcoholic. It was. You could get drink. It was not the alcohol standards. The amount of alcohol in it wasn't like today's because the goal wasn't a high level of alcohol. The main goal was to um, save the juice so that it could be used. And so if you go through a proper fermentation process... It can still be used. It'll turn to alcohol, and it won't turn to sour vinegar. And I took a few classes, biblical archaeology, and you realize unless you're drinking from a clean spring, which even those could be tainted, cisterns where so much water was kept, it was nasty. Like you, you don't, you don't want to drink regular w- saved water. Your children didn't want to drink it. So even though we would recognize today children should not be drinking alcohol, in many cases, when you understand the ancient water sources in so many places, 
w alcohol is a much safer alternative to some of the nasty, nasty, nasty water that would have been floating around. Okay, so, but especially at a wedding party, we read about this in the Gospel of John. Jesus goes to a wedding feast in Cana. What's going on here? This is an alcoholic wedding feast, and he's feasting with his people, uh, his companions there. And then if you remember from the story, we'll cover it in a little bit, Samson three times falls asleep in the bedroom with Delilah. And uh, the one time he's wrapped with cords, another time his hair is woven into a loom, and then finally his hair is cut off. How on earth could you possibly sleep through those three things that are happening to you without waking up? Well, probably he's incredibly intoxicated. As we read from the story and the other stuff that I'm not even going to cover tonight, it, it, it seems incredibly likely that he was a very heavy drinker. He's disrespected his vow. Instead of taking the lead, remember that the, is what the angel says, he's supposed to take the lead, in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines, Israel rejects Samson's leadership, it's supposed to be ship, not ships, that's a typo, and chooses Philistine rule. This is an interesting one here. Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etom. That's where he was staying. So he's attacked countless Philistines now, and he's slaughtered them. I mean, it's some violent, violent stuff. And, and some Philistines that hear about it, they want to have vengeance against, uh, against Samson. And so they're assembling an army, and they find out, or the Jews find out about it. They say, hey, we're about to be attacked by Philistines because of what Samson has done. And because Samson is a Jew like us, they're going to attack us. We don't want that. And so they go to Samson where he's staying. And they say, don't you realize that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? They're not just going to come get you in retribution, Samson. They're going to come in retribution for your kin. And we're your kin. So as they attack you, they're going to attack us too. They're ruling over us. What have you done? And he answered them, I merely did to them what they did to me. Man, doesn't that just sound so childish? Remember the words of Jesus? Turn the other cheek. Someone strikes you, you don't strike them back. Samson is just, he has in every way the, the mindset of this petulant child. And they said to them, him, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. This is a man incredibly flawed who's been, who's been raised up by God for a special purpose, to deliver them, and they want to hand over their deliverer to those who would kill him. Does that sound familiar? It's the story of Jesus in the garden. Instead of respecting his covenant with God about long hair, he disrespects God by allowing his hair to become tempting bait. The Philistines don't care about Samson's hair. They care about whatever it is that gives him that power. Whatever secret it is, that's what they're going to attack. They only uh, cut off his hair because he gives up the secret. The secret to the strength is in the last remaining thing of the covenant that he hasn't broken. God has been gracious to Samson. And component after component of, of this sacred covenant, Samson is completely disrespected. There's only one remaining part of the covenant that he's been faithful to. And because of that, God has allowed him to keep his superhuman strength. Now the very last thing He's letting the whole world know through Delilah, someone he's not even married to, we, we know from Scripture, that this is it. This is the equivalent of being given, I don't know, some family jewels from a friend and say, hey, we're going on a trip. Can you store these safely for me? And you're just supposed to sign out in front of your yard, family jewels stored in here. You know, I mean, it's just such disrespect. You're supposed to be discreet about this. You're supposed to keep this private and see this is a sacred thing between Samson and God and he gets drunk apparently and tells her 
Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. It's very clear in the other times when he marries a woman. It doesn't say that here. He's shacking up with a woman he's not married to. They've made no marriage vows, so don't be surprised that she doesn't stick to vows she never made. When she's given a good deal, she takes it. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how he can... We can overpower him so that they may tie, we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. See, when you make wedding vows, you talk about for better or worse, richer or poorer. He just finds her. He likes her. He says, hey, you look good to me. And apparently they start living together. She's never said for richer or poorer, Samson. She has an opportunity for richer she takes it she so he told her everything this is a few verses later she just keeps harassing him and these these crazy things happen you're like how does he not see what's going on here no razor has ever been used on my head he said because i have been a nazarite dedicated to god from my mother's womb if my head were shaved my strength would leave me and i would become as weak as any other man then the Philistine seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. The man who has lived his life by choosing whatever looked right in his eyes now has his eyesight taken from him. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. A little foreshadowing. Samson finally brings temporary salvation to his people. The last tragic scene of Samson. Then Samson reached toward the two center pillars. They've been brought out into the temple of Dagon to have this special celebration. The Philistines are celebrating the fact that their enemy, Samson, has been conquered and subdued. And let's parade him out like a monkey and we will worship to Dagon. That Dagon has given us our enemy, Samson. And he put him between two pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple and the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived this amazing scene that really in a sense you could say samson has been born for because of his terrible choices to finally have a, a, a truly amazing defeat of the enemies as was intended by god it causes his own death as well and yet had he been faithful to god his enemies would have died and he would have lived to tell the tale but he doesn't now, what do we do with Samson? When you read the story of Samson, you need to continually remind yourself, Jesus is the greater Samson. There's similarities throughout from the, from the pre-birth narrative of some sort of special miracle happening and, and the special things about his birth. And, and Jesus is the special Sam, or the greater Samson. Jesus is the greater Gideon. He's the greater Jephthah and, and Barak and, and Deborah and these people in the book of Judges. Jesus had similar opportunities to fail like Samson yet remained faithful to God. He therefore brought an eternal salvation Samson could never bring for both Jew and Gentile. So as we read the story of Samson, it's tragic and it's messy and it's violent, but he's a shadow of something greater to come. And so you're supposed to be reading the story, and the first people who would have been hearing the story of Samson, they see the tragedy of it all. This, this man with special strength from on high, who's been born in a miraculous way, God had such plans for him, and over and over and over, he blew it. Oh God, would you send another like Samson, born in special ways, given miraculous power on high, who doesn't blow it, that he can truly save us. God, would you give us a greater Samson? 
And then we have the New Testament. Well, there's another pre-birth story with some angelic visitors coming to a mother and said, guess what? You shouldn't be able to because you're barren. Or in this case with Mary, you shouldn't be able to because you've never been with a man. You're going to have a baby. This baby is going to be special. You're to name him Yeshua, a version of Joshua, which means he will save his people. He will do what Samson was supposed to do. And at every point along Jesus' journey, as in so many ways, it mirrors Samson's. He will remain faithful to his God. And Samson, God does work through Samson to provide a level of temporary deliverance. A lot of Philistines died that day Samson died. It gave a little reprieve to the Israelites as they're being oppressed by the Philistines. But man, it's short-lived. Because you keep reading Judges. The enemies are still around. But Jesus is the greater Samson. Jesus' death gives deliverance in a way and permanence contrasted with the temporal salvation of Samson. And we can say, praise God. Jesus succeeded where Samson failed. And Jesus isn't just the great deliverer for you and me. He's the great deliverer for Samson. I ran around a room. Samson's in, Samson is mentioned in the book of Hebrews, talking about his faith. He struggled in many ways, but we read still at his core, Samson understood that his strength came from God, that his salvation come, would come from God, and that deliverance could only come from God. And in the sad, tragic story of Samson, in his death still, we read in his prayer, we understand that he understood salvation comes from God. He had faith in spite of his weaknesses. And so because of that, he's mentioned in the hall of faith in the book of Hebrews. So as you remember Samson this week, go read his story. It's a sad story, but as you read it, you think, praise God, a deliverer finally came who didn't fail. And his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the greater Samson who could bring an eternal deliverance that Samson could never bring. We thank you for his life, his death, his resurrection. Father, may we in our lives never try to turn our deliverer over to our enemies. We do that as we turn back to sin and the sins that have conquered us in the past. We've been given deliverance through Jesus, but for whatever reasons, we believe the lies that the sin still rules over us. And so every time we sin, in a sense, it's like we're handing over Jesus to our enemies. May we not do that. May we walk in faith, praising God that Jesus, the greater Samson, our deliverer, can deliver us from every enemy, every oppressive sin that holds us back. May we walk in freedom as Christ's people, delivered from the sin that once oppressed us. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.